Hello, and welcome to episode 50 of the Bible Q&A with Pastor Stephen. My name is Stephen Pace, and I'm the senior pastor at Decatur Bible Church in Decatur, Michigan. On this podcast, I attempt to answer Bible questions in a clear but thorough manner. If you have a Bible-related question that you'd like me to consider for a future episode, feel free to email me your question to Pastor S-T-E-V-E-N-D-B-C at gmail.com. Again, that's Pastor Stephen DBC at gmail.com. And I'll be glad to consider your question for a future episode. Now, on this podcast... We are looking at part three of a look at and a review of the millennium. So if you haven't listened to already the two previous podcasts, which would be number 48 and 49, those are the ones that we did part one and part two, obviously, of uh, in our study of the millennium. Now on this podcast, we're going to start looking at what are the characteristics or conditions of the millennium. So again, on this podcast and then on the next few, what we'll be looking at is the answering the question, what are the characteristics or conditions of the millennium? Now in the two previous podcasts, and if you want to go back and listen in detail, Uh, Again, that's episodes 48 and 49. We looked at first, what is the millennium? And then in part two, when is the millennium? So by review, what is the millennium? I'm just going to read a definition from Ron Rhodes. Uh, This is an alternate definition uh, from the two previous podcasts that we used. Rhodes writes, Following the second coming, Jesus will personally set up his thousand-year kingdom on earth. So that's the way Rhodes describes it. And we've listened and read to before Ryrie's definition, for example, as well as Evans. And what you have is, obviously, subsequent to the second coming, Jesus literally returns, obviously, at the second coming. And subsequent to that, he literally establishes a kingdom on earth, and it is the thousand-year kingdom. Now, where does the term millennium comes from? Well, if you recall, it comes from the Latin milli. Milli means thousand, and then ani, A-N-N-I, which is year, thousand year. And so this is a general term that refers to Jesus's kingdom and as we looked at last time when is the millennium well we looked at three main views amillennial so that's a millennial and that essentially has the idea that there's no literal reign of Jesus on the earth Jesus rules and reigns through the church and believers more as a spiritualized concept than a literal one And again, there's variants of each of these, but that would be essentially what you're looking at for all millennial. Post-millennial, if you can just tell from the prefix, is the idea that the world will slowly be Christianized, in particular for a thousand years, then Jesus returns. Notice post. Um, So we see that. That is a less popular view. It started to go out of uh, popularity, we might say. Uh, come the Second World War, for obvious reasons. Uh, so you have all millennial, post millennial, and then the view that I hold to, which is pre millennial. So you can tell from the prefix there, it's before there, pre. So what happens is after the seven year tribulation, Jesus literally returns and he establishes a literal thousand year kingdom on the earth. So again, if you want some more details on what is and when is the millennium, I would encourage you to listen to the two previous podcasts. And one particular reason I would suggest that if you haven't already is I give some case evidence, if you will, for why I believe premillennial is the best biblical approach. 
But actually, as we look at today, and we will look at again in the next episode, what are the conditions of the millennium? I actually think one of the best evidences, if you will, if you were laying out a case of evidence for premillennialism, is actually, in fact, the conditions or characteristics of the millennium. Because, quite frankly, we don't see those today, um, those conditions that we're going to look at. So let's begin by just looking at a few. The first one I'm going to look at is Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. So again, that's Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. Now the interesting thing about this, uh, if you're familiar with the, the UN, the UN building in New York actually has this verse. It's actually verse 4, in fact, of Isaiah chapter 2 as a plaque, or it's on a plaque there. And Isaiah chapter 2 is, in short, describing God's universal reign. Let's just read the passage here. Now it will come about that in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, Jacob meaning Israel there, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now verse 4, as we get ready to read it, this is the verse that the UN has. And he will judge between the nations, and will render decisions for many peoples, and they will hammer their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. So again, I think actually one of the best evidences of premillennialism is in fact this idea of what we would call peace. Uh, this is a unique type of peace. Of course, the UN, I use that as the example with this verse, in particular verse 4. Uh, the idea is peace, and this is, of course, God reigning universally throughout all of uh, the inhabited earth. And uh, imagine that, a nations that come together, they no longer even need to study or learn war because war has ceased. Uh, so the idea of the millennium, one of the conditions is peace, but it's not localized, but universal. We might have localized, I might use that word, um, intermittent peace, but this is talking about universal, worldwide peace. To such an extent, there would be no war. Obviously, today, there's plenty of warfare that goes on. Another verse you could look at is, and we won't turn here, but Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 through 9. So again, that's Isaiah chapter 11. You can read that, verses 6 through 9 in particular uh, there. Isaiah has much to say about the millennium. Uh, that is the passage that speaks of the reign of the Messiah on earth. But those particular verses speak of peace that is in the animal kingdom. So whereas chapter 2 speaks of man, his ceasing of war, Isaiah 11 speaks of the animal kingdom, the lion laying down with the lamb, uh, which is well known. Uh, we also know uh, some other pass verses in that passage. For instance, uh, the child will play by the hole of a cobra. So again, these are pictures here of peace not only on earth in terms of humanity in terms of terms of no war but also peace in the animal kingdom i'll give you a few others here uh, we won't read this one but ezekiel 28 26 so ezekiel 28 26 actually you'll find a variant if you might say reading of isaiah chapter 2 in micah 4 verses 2 through 3. So again, Micah chapter 4, verses 2 through 3. This would be somewhat of a, if I could use the word variant reading. 
Uh, they actually have a bronze sculpture of this at the UN as well, uh, and it speaks of the beating and no more use of weapons for war, which is interesting. And then lastly, in terms of peace, not only in terms of war, humanity, and the animal kingdom, uh, you can also see this idea in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 10. And I would look forward to the day in which on the earth there is no more war, but there's also no need to even study it because the concept would not be, if you will, needed. It would be a foreign concept no longer needed. What a day that would be. Now moving on to the conditions of the millennium, another one is a unique type of joy. It's a time of personal joy unlike anything the world has ever known before. So, for example, you can find this in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 3 through 4, Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, and then once again, Zechariah chapter 8, verses 18 through 19. And again, that's a unique type of joy. Uh, it's a personal joy, unlike anything we would ever have known before. Another aspect to the conditions or characteristics of the millennium is this idea of holiness. Dwight Pentecost wrote this on holiness and the millennium. He says, the land will be holy, the city will be holy, the temple holy, and the subjects holy unto the Lord. Uh, this one is particularly interesting. So whereas you have peace and joy, you also have this idea of holiness, but it's not just holiness, uh, intermittent or random, but it is, as Pentecost says, it encompasses everything. So, for example, you see this in Isaiah chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. So you have Isaiah, and we'll read this, chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. It says, It will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, everyone who is recorded for life in Jerusalem. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and spirit of burning. So that's Isaiah 4, 3 through 4. Some other examples in Isaiah are chapter 38, verse 8, as well as chapter 45, verse 1. It's unfortunate Zechariah gets left off uh, almost all too often in the study of the scripture, but if you look at Zechariah 8, 3, but then in particular, I, uh, excuse me, Zechariah 8, 3, but then in particular, Zechariah 14, verses 20 through 21. Uh, again, you see this idea of holiness, this universal holiness. Uh, Mark Hitchcock puts it this way, Everything in it, the millennium, that is, will be set apart to God and for his use. Obviously, we don't see that today. Uh, we may see glimpses of it, just like we see glimpses of peace and joy, but the millennium is all-encompassing. Uh, I think Hitchcock is right there. What a day that would be. It's hard to fathom that everything that is used, everything is in a sense given unto the Lord, is set apart for God's purposes, whether that be work, tools, whatever it may be. The next two that we'll consider is glory. We know that during the millennium there will be a full display of God's glory. It's going to fill the entire earth. So rather than being, if you will, sporadic, it'll be something that fills the earth. That's God's glory. Uh, you see that in Isaiah 24, 23, for example. But another one I want us to look at is comfort. Jesus will be present to personally comfort his people. So we've seen peace, we've seen joy, holiness, glory of God filling the earth. But then there's this one about comfort, that Jesus will be present and he will comfort his people. You know, I like to think of 
the disciples. The disciples had that intimacy with Jesus Christ um, throughout his ministry. Imagine in the millennium with Jesus being present on earth, uh, that personal interaction, if you will, that present comfort that he'll give his people. A uh, well-known verse related to this is Isaiah chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Then you will say on that day, so obviously it's looking to a future specific period of time. Um, chapter 11 we spoke of earlier uh, speaks of the millennium. Chapter 12 continues with this idea. And it says, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for although you are angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. What a glorious day that would be. Imagine uh, the idea of Jesus being present to personally comfort his people. Of course, he comforts us today. Uh, the helper, the Holy Spirit that indwells each believer, uh, he comforts us. But imagine Jesus Christ being present and nearby, almost hard to fathom sometimes. But moving on, another particular condition or characteristic of the future millennium relates to health, uh, health conditions. I read, and I'm sure this is perhaps maybe slightly dated, um, uh, the report comes from the World Bank Research, and it says that U.S. life expectancy is approximately 78.54. That comes from the World Bank Research Company. David Jeremiah once wrote, In the millennium, human longevity will return to pre-flood levels. It's interesting because we do, when we read, for example, in Genesis chapter 5, we see this in verse 3, 27, and 32. We see the changing of human longevity. In other words, there was a long span of lifespans, and then they gradually began to decrease. But in the millennium, the idea of human longevity will be that instead of it being brief, it will go and begin to, if you will, stretch back to and go back to longer periods of age. You see this in... Isaiah 65, this is a good example of this. In Isaiah 65, beginning in verse 20, it says, No longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his days. For the youth will die at the age of 100, and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will thought to have been accursed. Obviously there you've got some, what I would think of as almost poetic type of language there, but you see the descriptions there where you have this longevity of life and the idea of a child and uh, not even reaching the age of 100 is almost unfathomable at that time. Obviously all of that is the implication is that human longevity will, of course, go back to as David Jeremiah says, the pre-flood, if you will, levels of longevity. A few other things to consider is sickness, deformities, all of those things, they begin to, if you will, go away. I like to think of it as you begin to see the curse that came upon the earth, the curse that came upon humanity in terms of sickness, deformities, and death, and all of these things, they begin to, if you will, be reversed. Uh, for example, Isaiah 29, 18, and Ezekiel 34, in verse 16. So let's pause for a second here. So the conditions of the millennium, the characteristics, will be peace. This is a worldwide peace, as so we would think of, we saw not only in terms of humanity, warfare, but also in the animal kingdom, there'll be a unique type of joy. There'll be holiness, in other words, like we saw with the quote from Pentecost and Mark Hitchcock, 
that it will be a holiness where everything is, just as the word said, set apart for the Lord. Obviously today, not everything is set apart for the Lord, but one day it will. We also have seen where in the characteristic condition of the millennium will be glory that fills the earth, as opposed to, if you will, sporadic or more localized. It will actually fill the earth. And then the comfort that God gives us will be unique. Jesus will be ever-present. He'll be actually present on the earth during the millennium to provide his people comfort. We'll see a change in the health conditions. But as we move on and before we finish for today, we're going to look at just a few others. We know one day in the millennium there'll be perfect justice. It'll be perfect justice because the justice will come from Jesus. And we would expect that to be the case. We see that in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 5, Isaiah 32, 16, and 42 verses 1 through 4. So in the condition of the millennium, one of those will be perfect justice because Jesus is perfect and will reign perfectly. I'm sure we all look forward to a day where there's true perfect justice. That also implies that we shouldn't expect it today, unfortunately. We may see it from time to time, but we will never see it fill the earth until Jesus is on the earth, you might say. We know that labor and productivity increases. It's fascinating that there's an increase in rainfall. You see this, for instance, in Ezekiel 34:26 as well as Joel chapter 2, verse 23. One thing you see as well is there is this removal of hunger and famine. I'm sure we're all familiar with the unfortunate situation sometimes where people are experience hunger or famine. In the millennium, that will not be the case. So, for example, Isaiah 35, verses 1 through 2. Amos chapter 9 verses 13 through 14 and then lastly Zechariah chapter 8 verses 11 through 12. Now before we conclude today's episode again next week we will look to return to look at some more of the conditions of the earth during the millennium. J. Danson Smith has a poem and the poem is entitled no shadows there and he looks to the future for the believer uh, he looks at what we would think of as heaven the eternal state and i like to think of it as what god has for those in christ and it's just a good reminder because once again we have so many things we look can look forward to and we think of the conditions j danson smith says no shadows there they joyfully behold him no cloud to dim their vision of his face, no jarring note to mar the holy rapture, the perfect bliss of that most blessed place. No burdens there, these are all gone forever. No weary nights, no long dragging days, no signs there, or secret silent longings, for all is now unutterable praise. No conflicts there, no evil host assailing, such warfare past, forever made to cease. Amen. What a glorious day that will be. And we look forward to not only the millennium, but the eternal state with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, until next time, God bless.